my name is Rich Gary. I am the state public health entomologist at the Ohio Department of Health. And today I'm going to be kind of covering the basics very early on. And I've seen several people out here who have a lot of experience and have heard me talk about these same topics. So if you guys can just bear with me for everyone else. Um, the, the material will get uh, a little bit more detailed as, uh, as the day goes on. We're going to start with, uh, with some pretty basic information. And I also want to point out in the agenda that you have, <coughs> uh, you'll see that I have uh, uh, four bullet points under the two talks I'm giving. That last bullet point, um, vector control planning and management of mosquito-borne diseases, we're bumping that down. Leanne will be covering that at the end of her talk. It's just, it, when I was presenting this in the earlier workshop, it was just kind of weird uh, placement. It, it, you know, so we're doing it this way just to, to improve the flow of information. <clears throat> so what I'm going to be covering um, are those first three bullet points. I'm going to go over uh, mosquito basic biology, and then I'll talk about the diseases we have in Ohio, um, and then finally, a little bit about the uh, mosquito surveillance system, and then uh, Leanne will follow up with more detailed information. So starting with uh, mosquito biology, um, with this photo here, this uh, electron uh, micrograph, I want to point out a couple of features of, of mosquitoes um, uh, that I think are, are worth noting. First, this is a female mosquito that you see here, and I'll, I'll explain the differences in the sexes here in a moment. Um, but the thing I want you to pay attention to is this little structure right here, which is called a palp. And we, uh, for identification purposes, we talk about uh, palps because they're different lengths and different species, and male palps are longer than female palps. So they're useful in identification. But I want to let you know a little bit about the function of the palp. This is the structure that the female mosquito uses to hone in on a host. This has her olfactory uh, sensory organs. It's the, it's the part of her body that, has, that basically functions as uh, taste and smell. Um, she has some of those structures as well on her antennae, but it's the palp that really helps her hone in on a, on a host. So this little structure right here is what makes is what make, uh, uh, this is the structure that makes mosquitoes so much of a problem. And of course you see the long mouth parts here. Uh, the, the mouth parts are actually very uh, fine needle-like structures uh, that are enclosed within this sheath here. And she'll, uh, she'll use those to pierce the skin. And then at the tip of her mouth parts are some structures that help her uh, find and you know, locate the, 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 uh, the area that most likely to have capillaries underneath. In Ohio, we have 59 species of mosquitoes. And what you'll notice looking at this list, well, first of all, you see that A.D. Sajip is there. That's not really an Ohio mosquito. This is a list of mosquitoes that have been collected in, in Ohio. Um, <clears throat> but what you notice is that at least half of this list are species that are in the genus Aedes. Uh, Aedes mosquitoes include many of our most important pest species. Uh, a, a, a handful of these species are important in disease transmission, and several of these species don't bite people at all. They either specialize, um, they bite birds, uh, some of them bite reptiles and amphibians, uh, and, they don't, and they don't bite mammals. But even some of those could be important in disease transmission. I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, mosquitoes are in the order Diptera. Uh, insect orders, you know, Lepidoptera, those are the butterflies and moths, and then you have the Coleoptera, which are the beetles. And then the Diptera, the Diptera are the flies and gnats, and mosquitoes are in this group. And the word Diptera literally means two wings. Most insects have four wings, uh, but the Diptera only have two. They've lost their second pair of wings. And I'll show you what that structure has become here in a moment. Uh, they have scales on their wings, which is unusual for flies. Um, usually you think of moths and butterflies as having scales on their wings. But this is a one fly that also has scales on its wings. It actually has scales all over its body. And then of course it has that elongated mouth, uh, mouth part, the proboscis, that's used to uh, pierce and uh, take a blood panel. Uh, the, 
then the differences between the sex, the males have really bushy antennae. Um, and I'll show you the difference here in just a moment. And, and of course, the, it's the only the female that takes blood. The males do not uh, feed on blood. So here you can see, looking at the structure of mosquitoes, you can see that the, the mosquito has these scales on the wings, which is easier to see with a magnifying glass or, uh, or under a microscope. You can see the proboscis here. You can see those short pouts. This is a female, you can tell because her antennae are not really bushy, and she has sort of a rounded tip to her hat. I'll show you the male uh, for comparison here in just a moment. But remember I told you that the diptera have two wings instead of four. If you look here, you see these two little tiny structures behind the front pair of wings. These are the vestigial remains of what would have been the second pair of wings. And this is characteristic of all diptera. It's a structure called a halter. And the mosquitoes use it to um, sort of to balance them in flight, sort of like a gyroscope. Kind of thing. They they work in opposition. They swing in opposition to the to the wings as they as they are um, as they're moving. And we've actually uh, when I when I when we did a fly study uh, working with uh, larger flies in in barns uh, egg egg production barns. Um, they had there were large horse flies that were pestering us, and we would grab the horse flies and take the hull tears off and let them go. It's kind of fun watching them kind of spin out of control. <clears throat> These are fun things you do if you're an entomologist. Okay, looking at the difference between males and females, you can see here the males have a much bushier pair of antennae. The males also have this hideous looking sort of clasper. These are, they look sort of like spider fangs on the rear end of the abdomen. And they use these to uh, grab hold of the female and mate with her. And the reason why their antennae are so bushy is that it, um, this is where they, you know, their, their sense of hearing, essentially. Um, and they can detect the wing beat frequency of the females, which is somewhat specific to species. So they can hear their species of female flying and then they can grab her and mate with her. <clears throat> the males also have very long palps that stick out. And the reason for this is that the males, they don't feed on blood, but they do feed on nectar. So they're not getting really close to the host. They, they need their pups at the tips of their mouth parts. <coughs> and again, the males do not feed on blood. They only feed on nectar. But the fact is, is that both sexes feed on nectar. Uh, this is also how the female gets her nutrition. Um, she feeds on blood specifically because she'll digest that blood meal. In the parts of the blood meal, once it's broken down, you know, blood meal is made of, uh, blood is made up of proteins. The proteins are broken down into amino acids. Those amino acids are rearranged and turned into egg yolk. And then, so basically, she's taking blood so that she can create yolk for her eggs um, that she will lay. She mates with the male once, and then uh, she takes the blood to get the yolk. <laughs> but she also feeds on nectar. And some mosquitoes are important pollinators. So looking at the life cycle of a mosquito, uh, pretty much the same as you see with butterflies and caterpillars. You've got the egg stage, the larva stage, which, you know, caterpillar or mosquito larva, a pupa or cocoon, and then the adult stage. And in the case of mosquitoes, uh, the female, uh, she lays her eggs always on the water, or in an area that will become inundated with water. And that's because the larval stage here is aquatic. And that stage lasts for just a few days. The eggs have to live a couple of days. Uh, the larval stage lasts for four to seven days. Um, and they go through a series of molts because it starts out as a really tiny larva. It'll go through four molts to become a larger larva. And then once it hits that stage, and this stage, by the way, uh, feeds, it filter feeds bacteria and so forth out of the column, out of the water column. And then the pupil stage, which you see here, um, you can, s this is sort of the cocoon of the, of the mosquito, the outer covering here. Unlike the caterpillar though, this can move. And so they hang out at the surface of the water, but they can dive. 
and you can almost make out the adult parts uh, forming. You can kind of see the legs forming in there, and there's the head um, of what will be the adult mosquito. This stage lasts one to two days on average, and then the mosquito, the adult mosquito, emerges out of that pupil uh, covering, and then uh, she'll go somewhere, dry her wings, um, and then the males and females will mate. Uh, she feeds on nectar, and then from that point on, she's made it, so she has stored the sperm from the male, and then she will just bite bird, uh, uh, sorry, bite a host, take a blood meal, and then a few days later, use that blood meal to, to make the yolk for her eggs. She'll lay the eggs. Once she lays the eggs, she's ready to take another blood meal. And so this cycle continues for the rest of her life. She takes a blood meal, a few days later she lays eggs, and then she's ready to take another blood meal. So that's how it works with mosquitoes. Looking at uh, the egg stage of mosquitoes a little bit more, uh, different types of mosquitoes lay their eggs differently. Remember I told you they'll either put the eggs on the surface of the water. In the case of uh, Anopheles mosquitoes, they just sprinkle their eggs on the water. They just hover over the water and drop their eggs. And their eggs are interesting in that they have like these little air floats on the side to hold them suspended at the water's surface. And they'll hatch after a day or two. Aedes mosquitoes, on the other hand, they tend to lay their eggs either in a depression where there will be water or in a tree hole or a container just above the water line. And this way, the next time it rains, the water level rises, the eggs are inundated, and then they hatch. Culex mosquitoes and some of their close relatives uh, lay eggs in rafts on the surface of the water. And this is true with all mosquitoes. When they first lay their eggs, the eggs are white. They turn black over a matter of hours. They just sort of hang it. <clears throat> but those eggs in a raft will just float on the surface of the water for a couple days and then all the larvae will hatch. And here you see an egg raft with all the larvae sort of simultaneously hatching. Then the larval stage. Uh, in the larval stage, remember I told you these are aquatic, but they still breed there. So what you see on the larvae, you see the structure here at the rear end is called a siphon. Uh, the siphon makes contact with the water surface it has sort of, it's ringed by hydrophobic hairs that sort of push the water surface out of the way. Um, and uh, they then have a direct airflow from the atmosphere. Um, this is how most mosquitoes do it. We have some that are specialized, such as the cattail marsh mosquito, which we have in Ohio, um, that rather, rather than come to the surface, they're capable of doing that, but they also have a piercing structure at their rear end, they can actually jab their siphon into uh, plant roots underwater and get air from the plants. That keeps them from having to come to the surface, making them vulnerable to predators and control. <laughs> the pupil stage, which lasts for a couple of days, a day or two actually, generally, um, this stage does not feed, uh, but it does breathe. And so you have, instead of a siphon, you have this little structure called a trumpet that also has contact with the surface of the water to allow for airflow. Inside this outer covering, the, the mosquito is developing into an adult. And if you look, you can actually make out the adult features, the legs forming here. There's the head, you can even see the antennae and mouth parts here. So when you're doing control for uh, mosquitoes, uh, one way that you can take advantage of these uh, structures is in the use of things like uh, the monomolecular films and the oils that uh, will disrupt that water surface tension, or it will actually uh, uh, make it so that these structures don't function, and so they suffocate and die. And then we have the adult stage. Here you see, uh, uh, these, these are all females here, um, and not much to say about this. Just showing females resting and, and feeding on blood here. Emerging from the pupil covering. 
In terms of life cycle, I'm sorry, overwintering, mosquitoes, different species overwinter in different ways. Uh, but I'm often asked, you know, what kind of uh, season are we going to have for mosquitoes because the winter was either mild or very severe. It really doesn't matter. That's not a factor. The only thing that is determined by a mild winter in an early spring like we had this year is that mosquitoes will be out a little earlier than they normally are. But as far as how bad the season's going to be, that's, that's determined more by whether we have drought or uh, flooding or, or things like that. The different species of mosquitoes over winter in different stages of their life. Uh, we have mosquitoes in Ohio that overwinter as larvae, actually, in the aquatic stage, even though the water freezes here. Uh, we have a few species like the pitcher plant mosquito that overwinter in the larval stage, uh, very quiescent at the bottom of the pitcher. These mosquitoes actually have antifreeze uh, uh, in, their, in their blood. Not car antifreeze, just an antifreeze substance. <coughs> Then we have species in Ohio that overwinter as adults. And these species tend to, uh, they tend to use uh, underground uh, storm sewers and culverts as overwintering sites. Uh, here you can see we've gone into some of the culverts in, in Columbus over the winter time and shining the light on the wall. You see the wall is often aligned with mosquitoes. And the ones we typically see are Culex and Anopheles mosquitoes. They overwinter as well. And for that reason, as soon as it gets warm early in the spring, they're among the first mosquitoes that are out. <clears throat> and then, of course, Aedes and several other species overwinter as eggs. And so you, here you see they just put, they'll put their eggs in the tree. They, it's just their normal reproductive cycle. It's just that the egg stage is the stage that overwinters. And this stage is more locked into daily. So they won't start to come out until the days are longer. We'll get down up here. So the mosquitoes we have in Ohio can occur throughout the state, <coughs> depending on uh, where their preferred habitat is. So for instance, you can find pitcher plants throughout Ohio, wherever you have, I'm sorry, pitcher plant mosquitoes, wherever you have pitcher plants. And I can think of two or three locations. So that's where you would find that species. Species that um, live in cattail marshes, you're not going to find them away from cattail marshes, but anywhere where you have them, you'll find those species. So, uh, so for most of our uh, Ohio mosquitoes, they're found throughout the state as long as the habitat is suitable for them. <coughs> and different species take advantage of different types of habitats. We have some that breed in permanent bodies of water, um, a lot of Anopheles and cattail marsh mosquitoes breed in permanent bodies of water. We have most of our mosquitoes, though, take advantage of more temporary types of, of water bodies, uh, including containers that are both natural and artificial. And I'll also talk here in a moment about the flag range. <coughs> I'll cover this uh, a little later. Okay, like I said, we do have some mosquito species that will live in permanent bodies of water. Um, but as you can imagine, uh, there are a lot of dangers for mosquitoes in this habitat. So uh, a lot of mosquitoes rather uh, uh, live in, uh, they live in uh, more temporary bodies of water. But the ones that do live in permanent bodies of water tend to live in areas where you have emergent vegetation, like these cattails. It gives them some cover from predators. You won't typically find mosquitoes breeding in a situation like this bottom picture. They tend to be more in areas like, like this. Most of the mosquitoes we have breed in more temporary bodies of water. And we have species that uh, specialize in vernal pools, which are the pools that you see this time of year that will dry up and then they won't hold water for the rest of the summer. Um, but these are what the snowmelt pools and uh, the pools that we see in early spring and tend to have more, mostly 80 species breeding in these conditions uh, in this habitat and, um, and in particular we tend to have the more Canadian type 80 species so they do tend to come out a little bit early in the spring um, but most of them are just pest species and with these vernal pool species you have one generation a year it's the generation that 
uh, emerges in the spring. They'll continue to bite throughout the uh, spring and summer, and then they'll continue to just lay their eggs in the area where this vernal pool was. And those eggs will sit until next year when the vernal pool forms again, and then you'll have a massive outbreak of those mosquitoes. They can be very bad. When you go into these habitats, the mosquitoes can drive you out. <clears throat> and then we have uh, species, a lot of species uh, of our more pesky mosquitoes are, um, are floodwater mosquitoes. So whenever you have flooding during the summer after heavy rains, they'll breed in, in puddles in flooded areas like you see in this bottom picture. These species also tend to take advantage of ditches that hold water that aren't free flowing. And these ditches can become organically polluted with grass clippings and other things, and then they become ideal habitat for culex, which I'll talk about here in a moment. <clears throat> Then we have mosquitoes that um, specialize in container breeding. So they, they also take advantage of temporary water bodies, but their preference is for containers. And in nature, those containers might be pitcher plants in the case of a pitcher plant mosquito, or rock holes, or tree holes. But of course, humans have provided lots of additional habitat for these species to take advantage of. And so these species that would normally breed in these habitats will also breed in these habitats. And that's where we get a lot of problems with disease transmission. Now back to Culex. Um, Culex are a little less picky about whether it's a container or flood water, um, but what they really like is organically rich or polluted water. And so um, one of the habitats that we've sort of created for them that's ideal are these catch basins, storm sewer catch basins, uh, that collect debris uh, from the road. Uh, and you know, some of these catch basins are several feet deep. So even when we're in a drought, these catch basins are still holding water. And here you can see in this photo, uh, just having the light shine down has disturbed the pupae uh, and larvae in this catch basin and so they're diving and causing ripples in the surface of the water but you can also see the adults lining the wall here uh, the newly emerged adults so this is ideal habitat for culex breeding culex mosquitoes are the principal vector of west nile virus so these habitats have been key in, in producing uh, west nile virus carrying mosquitoes Flight range uh, for mosquitoes, different species can fly different distances. And um, we have some, most mosquitoes fly one to three miles over their lifetime. Um, but we do have some that are more, what are called peri-domestic mosquitoes. These are mosquitoes that live in close association with humans. And they tend to have a much lower um, uh, flight range. And here you see, for example, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus, which generally live in peri-domestic environments, which just means around the home environments. Uh, they tend to have a shorter flight range, 200 to 400 meters, and, and in reality, probably much lower even than that. But we do also have mosquitoes that can fly very long distances. The salt marsh mosquitoes, uh, Aedes solicitans, uh, the Atlantic salt marsh mosquito. This mosquito uh, commonly flies 20 to 40 miles from where it was uh, where it was hatched. Uh, and usually the, the flight is just to find food. Um, and just to give you an idea of how far these fly, uh, we don't have salt marshes in Ohio, but we do have this species in Ohio. Um, and it's typically found in areas where salt is stored. And if any of that leaks into the nearby groundwater, it, it can to provide uh, saltwater habitat for them to breed. Um, we'll get We'll occasionally have these turn up in the collections that are submitted to us, and when we trace them back, we find that they're often collected in areas where salt is stored. Okay, moving on to diseases. Are there any questions about basic mosquito biology before I move on? Yes? Back to the vernal um, holes, I don't really remember what they are. It's just a, it's vernal is spring, so the, the vernal pools are 
uh, pools that are formed. Uh, they're called snowmelt pools, but they're all they're just water they're water holding pools early in the spring that for whatever reason tend to be dry for the rest of the year. So uh, you'll see them a lot when you're driving up and down the freeway, looking into the wood, wooded areas. You'll see water, and it's usually this time of year that you see it, but then it dries up and you don't see it during the summer. And vernal pools are important because these are areas where a lot of salamanders and amphibians. Uh, there's an important habitat for them, but there are also species of mosquitoes that are associated with these. Fortunately, those vernal pool species are not important disease transmitters, but they are important pests. They tend to be right there in that habitat, though. So if you go into a wooded area where there was a vernal pool, you'll often get run out by mosquitoes. Did I answer your question? Yes. So is that an area that we would focus on um, if we were doing homeowner education mm -hmm. if, and we were able to provide them dunks, is that something that we would give them education that they could use the dunk or not? Because we don't want them to be killing dragonflies, but we want to control. Yeah, I, I don't know how much it's a, an issue because these vernal pools tend to not be in people's yards. They tend to be more natural settings. And when we get complaints about vernal pools, it's usually a metro park that has vernal pools and people are saying the mosquitoes are so bad in the metro park and they want the metro park to do something about the mosquitoes. And the metro park says, no, it's a natural environment. We're not going to do anything about it. But I think dunks would, it, I mean, it's usually, a, it, the pools are usually pretty large. I don't know how effective a dunk would be for something as large as a vernal. <laughs> Although we did get called once to a truck stop on the side of I-71 because there was a vernal pool just off the truck stop. And we were catching some really neat, big, monstrous mosquitoes. Okay, now I'm focusing on disease. Diseases that mosquitoes transmit. Here's the uh, list of mosquitoes that I showed you earlier. Uh, these are mosquitoes in Ohio. And we've highlighted the ones here that are associated with disease transmission. So uh, you see most of the mosquitoes we have are not in this list, but the, ne that the next disease that comes along, maybe one of them will be. Um, so it's good to know what you have and where you have it. So just very quickly going through this list, um, uh, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus highlighted in red here. Uh, we have, uh, these mosquitoes are associated with um, uh, dengue, chikungunya, and Zika virus is also yellow fever, uh, which fortunately we don't have in Ohio, um, but people travel to areas where these diseases occur, and if someone come back, uh, were to come back to Ohio infected, the local mosquitoes might pick that disease up and transmit, which of course is what the concern is with Zika. And I will say that uh, while Aedes aegypti is on the list, it is a tropical species, and so uh, it tends to be somewhat limited in its and it's uh, in the areas where it can become established. So we may periodically see it in Ohio because people, uh, because the mosquito can easily be moved around by people. Uh, they lay their eggs in containers and tires. So moving plants and tires and uh, things like that from down south to up north, you can quickly transport these mosquitoes around. Uh, the point is they won't become, they won't likely become established this far north. Um, we tend to see Aedes aegypti more in extreme southern tier areas of the country, which is where we've seen local Zika outbreaks so far, uh, southern Texas and southern Florida. Aedes albopictus, also a potential vector of this disease, uh, is very well established in Ohio. It arrived the same way, plants, tires, uh, wherever the eggs could be laid, people bring them up. Um, and then, um, and what we noticed last year with the surveillance that was done in Ohio, uh, in the southern part of the state, uh, they seem to be pretty widespread. Uh, as you move further north in the state, they seem to be a little bit more um, focused in areas uh, 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 very locally. So they're harder to find as you move north. Um, and I know in Summit County, I know that uh, you guys have found them here, and I think they've only, uh, they've all been associated with a tire yard, tire box. Isn't that right, Andrew? Yeah. So as you move further north, they tend to be more focal. <clears throat> and when I talk about flight range, uh, one important characteristic of these mosquitoes is that they don't fly very far. And so if you don't locate, if they're not widespread in the area, and you don't set a trap very close to where they're breeding, you may miss them. 
So they could be breeding, you could set a trap and not catch them because you were 20 feet too far away from where they breed. Uh, other mosquitoes on the list that are disease transmitters in Ohio, uh, the Aedes triseriatus here in yellow. Uh, this is our uh, uh, tree hole mosquito in Ohio. This is our uh, vector of lacrosse encephalitis. I'll talk more about that. Um, Anopheles, we have a couple of species in Ohio that are capable of transmitting malaria if malaria were to be introduced into the state. And again, these are diseases that people can acquire when they travel, they bring back, the mosquitoes can pick it up and transmit it. And then uh, Culex, Pipians and Culex restaurants, both involved in uh, West Nile virus transmission, Culex Pipians being the primary vector. And what, what I mean by primary vectors, I mean this is the most important vector, the one who is the biological vector of the, uh, that maintains uh, the cycle of disease transmission. Secondary vector is one that could potentially just pick it up and transmit it. And then for Eastern Equine Encephalitis, which we have seen in Ohio, uh, we have Culocito melanura, which is a mosquito that strictly feeds on birds. Um, but then we have other mosquitoes that could act as a bridge vector, meaning these mosquitoes could pick it up from the birds and then transmit it to horses or people. So here you can see a summary of the disease cases that we've had in Ohio in the last, uh, this year and last year. Um, we had 17 cases of West Nile virus uh, and four fatalities from that. One thing to note about West Nile virus, we have bad years and we have not so bad years, but we haven't had a year yet where we didn't have at least one fatality. So it's a, it's a, very, uh, it's a very bad disease. And even though it's not much in the press anymore, and of course everyone's talking about Zika, it's important to remember here in Ohio, this is our most important mosquito-borne disease. And prone to outbreaks, so. Next, oh, next is lacrosse encephalitis. We had nine cases last year. We're, we're, we're very early in the mosquito seasons. So we're, we're not seeing cases of these yet. Um, but lacrosse encephalitis is a disease that Ohio leads the nation in the number of cases. And so last year we had nine cases in seven counties. But, uh, <clears throat> then the next, uh, there, uh, the next uh, four diseases there, these are all travel associated diseases. And so you can see the number of cases of each we saw last year. And then this year, um, we've already seen a few cases of dengue, Zika, and malaria. This is pretty typical. Okay, I'm going to uh, cover these diseases uh, from the standpoint of virus cycle because the virus cycle determines the type of surveillance that we would do for the disease and whether or not we would test the mosquitoes. So the first one I'm going to talk about is in this first cycle, we're talking about diseases that are normally transmitted by mosquitoes, uh, I mean between mosquitoes and other animals, not humans. And in this case, we're looking at um, a, a, a virus that's normally transmitted between mosquitoes and birds. And so what, you do, what we're monitoring, uh, the, the, these types of diseases are diseases that we would, um, we would do mosquito surveillance and testing for. Uh, in particular, we're talking about West Nile virus here. This also applies to St. Louis encephalitis. But these are viruses that are typically transmitted between mosquitoes and birds. And mosquitoes prefer to feed on birds. They really don't bite people very much. <clears throat> However, when the, when the virus gets to a certain level in the, in the birds or, and or mosquitoes, then you start to have a higher risk of human cases. So we, essentially what we're doing is we're monitoring uh, the outbreak in birds by testing mosquitoes. When we start to see the infection rates go up in mosquitoes, it tells us that there is sort of an outbreak going in birds. And what we call amplification is essentially an outbreak for them. Um, but we're, when we see the virus levels going up in mosquitoes, we know that the risk to humans is much higher. Uh, and so that's why we monitor these diseases. <coughs> that's why we test these.
So uh, as I told you, this, uh, this applies to St. Louis and St. Elias and West Knot virus. Uh, since its introduction into the country, West Nile virus has been by far the most important of these diseases that we've monitored. And this is because, you know, we had that initial outbreak back in the early 2000s, uh, but there have been periodic outbreaks since then. And these outbreaks are hard to predict. So for that reason, we test the mosquitoes and we watch, we monitor the infection rates of mosquitoes. So it gives us some prediction of whether or not we're gonna have an outbreak or outbreak conditions um, in a particular year. But remember that West Nile virus, a virus that anyone can contract, um, is more severe the older you are, tends to be more severe the older you are. So, and, uh, and people who are over 60 years old, uh, the virus can be very severe. The principal vector is Culex pipians, and this mosquito prefers to feed on birds. But once the bird, they, they tend to feed mostly on fledgling birds. Once the birds have fledged and left the nest, then they become a harder target. And so it's possible that they switch their behavior late in the summer. And that's when we start to see human cases when we have outbreak conditions. <coughs> and remember, these are the mosquitoes that like to breed in those catch basins and polluted conditions. Looking at the incidence of, uh, of a West Nile virus in the US, you can see that it varies as you move from east to west. And the thing that's interest, or noteworthy here is that there are different vectors in different parts of the country. And so when you look at our area of the country, Culex pipiens is the principal vector. This mosquito really prefers to feed on birds. It's, I've never known myself to be bitten by one, to be honest with you, but they must, <clears throat> like people periodically, uh, to transmit the disease. Um, and then when, as you move out west where you can see the incidence is much higher, they have another species called Culex tarsalis. This mosquito also likes to feed on birds, but it doesn't mind feeding on people or horses. And so, um, and so you have a lot more cases of disease. And then if you notice this high incidence down in the Louisiana, Mississippi area, the information I've heard in the past suggests that Aedes albopictus, the Asian tiger mosquito, actually may be an important vector down here. Although they also have a Culex species down there, Culex quincapaciatus, uh, that will readily bite people. Looking in Ohio, you can see that the incidence of West Nile virus over time is also not distributed evenly across the state and tends to be uh, occurring at a higher incidence in the western part of the state. And this sort of carries over into Indiana. We see it more in the eastern half of their state. Not quite sure what's going on there because our surveillance has been pretty weak, generally, from that part of the state. Um, and so a lot of our effort in the last few years has been to uh, send field teams to that area of the state to collect mosquitoes. But regardless, that's the area of the state where we see a higher incidence of West Nile virus, also up in the um, Cuyahoga County area. And what we know about this area is that they have a very old um, sewer system infrastructure, uh, ideal areas for Culex to breed and hide. And so we've had a lot of cases come from that area. And the red dots there just show the cases from last year. And if you're wondering why the, the we had uh, 17, 18 cases, I think it was 17 in the, in the end, if you wonder why the dots don't uh, add up, it's because some of these dots, are, some of these have more than one dot in the, in the location. We actually had two West Nile virus cases that were on the same street, completely unrelated. <clears throat> and here, if you look, uh, uh, this shows this graph shows the um, uh, the, uh, the number of West Nile virus cases we've had each year since its introduction. And what you see here is that we had a large outbreak initially, which is expected when you have a new disease, uh, that sort of lasted for two years. And then um, we had varying amounts of activity, and then we had another outbreak in 2012. Now we had that outbreak in 2012, and it was bad for us, but it was really bad for Texas. Um, they had been dealing with West Nile virus as well, uh, but the outbreak they had was much worse. They had like 5,000 cases, well, more than 5,000 cases. And it was way worse than anything they had seen to that point. Um, I think uh, the take home message here is that uh, the outbreaks are, it, it's hard to predict outbreaks, where they will occur or when they will occur. 
So again, a uh, good reason to do the surveillance and testing of these mosquitoes. Okay, moving on to the next virus cycle. In this virus uh, cycle, we have mosquitoes transmitting virus between, um, uh, or the virus is being transmitted rather between uh, mosquitoes and mammals. And looking at lacrosse encephalitis specifically, uh, this virus is transmitted between rodents, um, chipmunks, and squirrels, mostly, between those animals and the tree hole mosquito. And of course, the tree hole mosquito is not a picky feeder. It will happily bite humans. And so um, the virus is maintained in nature in these, uh, in these animals, but uh, the mosquitoes will readily bite humans and so can very easily be transmitted uh, to people. And we, as I said before, we lead the nation in the number of cases of lacrosse encephalitis uh, all time and, and annually. <clears throat> as far as testing mosquitoes go, uh, this one is not as easy because the mosquitoes that transmit the, or the mosquitoes involved in the natural cycle, because they readily bite people, we can have human cases occurring very early in the season. Also, uh, these mosquitoes, the tree hole mosquitoes, don't come to any of our traps in particularly large numbers, which means that we're not getting large numbers of mosquitoes to test. And so it's harder to detect the infections in a timely way in the mosquitoes, which is why we don't generally recommend doing testing. We have the capability of doing it. Um, and if there were a situation where we needed to do it, we could. But in general, we, we recommend that if this vector is found, that it should be eliminated because it's a threat. Its mere presence is a threat. Lacrosse encephalitis is a virus that has very similar symptoms to West Nile virus in, the, uh, in that it causes encephalitis, meningitis, it can cause acute flaccid paralysis, which is very much like stroke, stroke type symptoms. It can have long lasting effects in a person who's uh, affected by or infected by this virus. It tends to be less fatal than West Nile, um, but it can have, as I said, a long term impact. The other thing is that this virus tends to be more severe uh, in younger people. So children and teenagers uh, who are infected by this virus tend to have more severe effects. <clears throat> and this mosquito, the Aedes triceriatus mosquito, uh, is a container breeder. And uh, it, we tend to find, uh, when we do investigation of lacrosse cases, we tend to find that there is a lot of natural habitat in the area that supports these mosquitoes. A lot of beech maple forest. And then the people who live in these areas uh, help add to that by having containers that hold water around their homes so that the mosquitoes kind of spread out of their habitat and into people's uh, yards and, and, and breed. Looking at the national instance of lacrosse encephalitis, you see it's much more restricted in range. Um, found uh, historically in the upper mid, I mean in the Midwestern U.S., uh, as I said, Ohio leads the nation all time in these cases. The virus is actually named after across Wisconsin, um, where it was described, but, uh, but most of the cases have occurred in Ohio. More recently, we've seen more cases in the Appalachian areas, West Virginia, uh, down into North Carolina. <clears throat> Looking at the incidents in Ohio, we've had lacrosse encephalitis reported from all counties of Ohio uh, over time, but more recent, uh, I'm sorry, but when you look at uh, the incidence of the disease, you can see that there are some areas of the state that report it much more frequently. And these areas of the state tend to be areas where we have a lot of forest habitat where these mosquitoes live, particularly Knox and Holmes County. We see a lot of lacrosse cases there. And the red dots again show you the cases we had last year. Looking at our historical case counts, you can see that over time, uh, we've had lacrosse encephalitis pretty much every year um, in Ohio. And looking at these bars, 
and show you the number of cases that we've had in the U.S. The red portion of the bar at the bottom shows you the number of cases that were in Ohio each of those years. And some years we, we, uh, uh, we account for half of the cases in the country. Um, <clears throat> Okay, moving on to the third and final type of cycle that we see in Ohio. Um, this is actually, hopefully not in Ohio. Uh, in this cycle, uh, uh, the, mosquito, the virus is transmitted between mosquitoes and primates in nature. And here you see uh, the virus transmission here of chikungunya, dengue, and Zika, also yellow fever, uh, not included. Uh, but uh, this is, all of these viruses originated in the African uh, subcontinent and um, typically are transmitted in nature between uh, one of these very, uh, one of these Aedes species that are very closely related to Aedes aegypti and forest primates. And what can happen with these viruses because humans are considered prim uh, close relatives to other primates, um, the virus can jump into uh, more of an urban cycle where either a person is bitten by one of these mosquitoes or Aedes aegypti or Aedes albopictus by an infected monkey and then bring it into more of an urban setting and then you can have transmission that has shifted from a forest cycle to an urban cycle uh, between humans. And so that's what we see with all of these diseases uh, that, um, uh, that the virus is, is sustained in this cycle between humans and, and mosquitoes. And so the important characteristic of these viruses for us is that we, because we maintain what's called a viremia uh, in these mosquitoes, meaning the virus stays in our blood for an extended period of time, um, it, it means that we can then pass the virus on to another mosquito if it bites us. With the other viruses that I've mentioned so far, um, humans do not maintain a viremia. We are considered dead and hosts for all those viruses because it quickly goes to our central nervous system. It's not in our blood. And in order for a mosquito to pick it up from us, they have to pick it up in the blood. And so since it's not in our blood, the mosquitoes can bite us if we're infected, but they won't pick up the virus. That's not the case with this virus, with these viruses. We maintain the virus in our blood for a week or so, which is plenty long enough for these mosquitoes to, to pick them up. And so, of course, uh, the virus that we're most concerned about here is Zika. This is the one uh, that, we, <coughs> that we've seen the, the most recent outbreak of. But if you recall, a year before Zika hit, we were still dealing with chikungunya, which is another one of these very closely, um, or has the same sort of virus cycle. And it is possible, by the way, to be bitten by a mosquito that has more than one of these diseases. You know, we've been tracking Zika patients uh, in Ohio, and we've had a number of people uh, come from areas like Puerto Rico that have turned out to be infected with more than one of these viruses. They can have dengue, chikungunya, and Zika all at once. <clears throat> the thing about Zika virus is that we've known about it for a long time, and we haven't been too concerned about it because in terms of the symptoms, you know, the other viruses I've talked about, they cause encephalitis, and you get very sick um, and you could die. With this virus, what we knew about it before the outbreak in Brazil is that it mostly caused fever and rash, and it seemed to be pretty mild. We didn't know about the birth defects that it could cause. Uh, and so that's what we found out since the virus, since the large outbreak that occurred in, uh, in Brazil, is that, um, is that while the person who's infected by the mosquito might have pretty mild symptoms or no symptoms at all. If, the, if that person is a pregnant woman, the virus could be occurred to her unborn child where it can cause very severe birth defects and microcephaly and, um, and even death. And as I mentioned, we've known about this, this virus for a very long time. Uh, it was first discovered in 1947 in Uganda, uh, just in the process of doing arbovirus surveillance uh, using monkeys, I think it was a macaque, that was first discovered in. And then, at, you know, from that point on, the virus turned up in humans. Uh, you know, we had a, a, a few uh, cases of, uh, of, of the disease reported, 
all, all, all the time with pretty mild symptoms. And over a very long period of time, we're talking about a couple dozen cases. But the virus also spread. It spread into Asia. And then we started seeing more recently fairly large outbreaks of this uh, virus in the Pacific Islands. And from the Pacific Islands, it's thought that uh, actually during a competition where some Pacific Islanders who were infected brought the virus over to Brazil in 2014, late 2014, and then we had this large outbreak that, that, uh, that started once the virus got into Brazil because there were lots of babies to die there. And that began the, the outbreak that we're currently dealing with. So now the risk of, uh, of Zika virus transmission, you can see this is the worldwide map showing areas of, of most concern. And in the US, uh, particularly you see that uh, Texas and Florida are, are highlighted because we've had the local transmission in both of those states. So now looking at the map that, um, that CDC uh, released earlier last spring caused a lot of anxiety for health departments who had never seen, or for states who had never seen these species, um, suddenly to find out that they were within the range of the mosquitoes. <clears throat> These are um, these range maps are, are based on uh, historical data and also some modeling and you know just just trying to, to determine areas where the mosquito might possibly occur. Definitely not um, saying that the mosquito occurs in every area within this range, but you can see that for Aedes aegypti, the range is considered to include southern Ohio. But I will reiterate that Aedes aegypti cannot survive below freezing temperatures in any of its life stages. So unless it, unless it gets underground um, and can be sustained on rats or something like that, it's not going to survive the winter here. It's, it, you typically find this species in, in extreme southern areas. But again, we have had it Hades sagipti. We have collected it in Ohio. And as CDC points out, even if it can't be established here, if it's, trans if it's transported here in the spring, it could possibly become a problem before winter, you know, during the time it's here. <clears throat> Aedes albopictus, on the other hand, we know that we have this mosquito in Ohio. We found it throughout the southern half of the state. It's pretty widespread, actually, down here. I had it in my yard in, in Columbus. Um, <clears throat> and it's also, uh, we've also collected it from Cleveland and Akron. So what I'm showing you here, this is basically our historical data on Hades aegypti collections in Ohio. So we've collected it only from a few sites. All of these sites are entire um, facilities. At least I'm, a, I'm familiar with most of these. And the ones I'm familiar with are all tire facilities, used tire facilities. <clears throat> and actually, we collected them in those tiger facilities while we were looking for Asian tiger mosquitoes. Um, Asian tiger mosquitoes, when they first were introduced into the U.S. in the mid-1980s, well, these were a big concern because we thought these will transmit dengue and possibly yellow fever and other diseases. So we were looking for them, and in the process of looking for them, we found some Aedes aegypti. Um, it's worth noting that all of these collections, while we were looking all year for them, all these collections were made pretty late uh, in the in the summer, um, which indicates to me that pro you know they may have been brought in at some point in the spring and summer, and it took that long for them to get to detectable levels within those facilities before we pick them up in our traps, and then probably they didn't survive the winter. <clears throat> So here's a map of Aedes albopictus, at least our understanding of where it's located in Ohio at this point. Um, this is based on our trapping efforts last summer, um, working with local health departments, mosquito abatement districts, and also our own field staff out collecting. Uh, this map shows you all the areas of the state where um, surveillance took place. So anything in any level of blue, that's where surveillance took place. Uh, and the uh, solid darker blue um, uh, shaded counties. These are counties where we've actually found Hades albopictus breeding. As I, as I mentioned, it's pretty widespread in the southern part of the state. 
So we'll continue with that surveillance this year and into the foreseeable future because we want to get a, as good a map as we can of the distribution of these mosquitoes in Ohio. And we also, beyond just mapping where they're found, we kind of want to know where the hot spots are, you know, where the relative abundance of these mosquitoes are in different areas of the, of the state as well. I think this is also noteworthy. Uh, from the Emerging Infectious Diseases uh, Journal back in September 2009. And I think the, the lesson here is that, um, you know, emerging diseases are, are mosquito-borne diseases are happening all the time. And it's, you don't necessarily know how bad it's gonna be. Because as I mentioned, we already knew, we knew about Zika. And when, when, I, when, when you, me and my colleagues, when we discussed it, like it, it causes fever. So as far as viruses go, that's the one I want. I don't want the virus. It turns out it was much worse than we thought. And so I think this is, I think there's a good lesson here because this kind of gives you an idea of what the attitude about was, or the attitude about Zika was before we knew that it caused microcephaly. And also a reminder that there was a time when we thought West Nile virus was a pretty mild disease. Okay. Are there any questions about the diseases? Yes, sir. The meetings out of Texas that you found in Ohio, was that people sending you their collections or just telling you they talked? No, it was a combination of, uh, the, I mean, we, we, they were in our lab. Uh, so it was a combination of our trapping efforts and, lo and the uh, local partner trapping efforts. But it was all mosquitoes that came through our lab. So if you have some that we don't know about and you want us to know about, that's good news. All right, so I'm going to finish up talking a little bit about surveillance in Ohio. And as all of you well know, we rely very heavily on the partnerships we have with you guys um, to conduct the surveillance uh, statewide. Uh, most, the vast majority of the surveillance is done uh, by uh, local health departments and mosquito abatement districts, and in some cases, street departments. But um, what I want to talk to you about just he, uh, briefly here is how we're structured at, um, at the Department of Health, uh, at the State Department of Health, and what, and what our role is in the surveillance. So here you see uh, sort of a, um, a table of organization for our program, uh, for our mosquito uh, program. And you see that uh, uh, I'm in charge of the zoonotic disease program, which doesn't just deal with mosquito-borne disease, it also deals with all zoonotic diseases. So I spend a lot of my time also on rabies and Honda virus and other things. Um, but I will oversee the mosquito operation during the summer, and that includes um, our entomology lab and also our field crew. So we do hire, uh, we have been able to hire for the last few years, a field crew that we can send out uh, to support uh, mostly smaller local health departments that lack uh, the personnel to go out and do field collection. Basically, uh, to try to fill in some of those holes. Remember I told you we didn't get a lot of surveillance from the western part of the state. And a lot of that is because the health departments there are pretty small. And so we have hired this field crew to go out and try to help us fill in some of the gaps in, in Ohio where we're not getting surveillance information. So we'll continue to work uh, to, hire, to hire field crews and do that type of work. Um, and in addition, in the entomology lab, we have a new entomologist, Leanne Garrett, who's, who's going to be speaking right after me. Um, and she will oversee uh, the mosquito operation in there that I'll tell you about here in just a moment. And um, a large part of the work that we do relies on temporary staff. So we hire a lot of temporary staff in, in the summertime. But these are the key folks who will be in place. In addition, we have a virology lab associated with our, our human Public Health Laboratory. The virology lab there, which is overseen by Kevin Stoner, um, they have a lab scientist who will be doing the mosquito testing for us. Uh, they also do human testing and so forth. Uh, but they also will hire some temporary staff to hire, to help with the, um, you, you know, we, we, we get a bunch of samples. So they just need, they need bodies to help get the work done. <clears throat> So our field crew, as I mentioned, uh, they are uh, responsible for doing collections in a lot of areas of the state where we have very little surveillance data. So we send them out 
uh, in the field. And basically, they're not just going into people's jurisdictions and collecting mosquitoes. They work with the local health departments. Um, and then the local health departments sort of guide them to areas where they want mosquitoes collected. We've also been involved in um, helping with um, site investigations. Um, and these are the type of uh, investigations you might do if you had a Zika uh, travel uh, associated Zika case. You know, our EPIs will recommend to your health department to do uh, a vector assessment. And this is the kind of thing that we, that I'm talking about, where, where you would go out and you would look for any, any sign of mosquito breeding. You might even set some traps around the area to see if you, if you pick up any potential vectors of Zika virus. Um, but what you're seeing here are pictures of lacrosse investigations that we've done in the past. So it's very similar. We're, we're talking about doing the same types of things where um, you try to determine where the person was infected. You go out and do vector assessments in the areas where this person spent time and look for breeding mosquitoes um, and, and deal with any vector issues in the area. But what we spend most of our energy on is dealing with the samples that you send us. Uh, that will keep us very, very busy. Um, and we get samples from all over the state, but uh, I would say this area probably is responsible for at least two-thirds of the samples that we get. So I know that there are some well-established programs in this region of the state. Um, and so we spend our time uh, identifying the mosquitoes and then um, processing them for testing. We'll send them over to the lab where they do uh, RNA extraction and PCR on all of the Culex mosquitoes, because as I said, we're focused on West Nile virus. That being said, we also have the capability of testing for other viruses. So if there was a particular need, uh, we'd be able to um, we'd be able to test mosquitoes for those viruses. Looking at this past year, um, we typically, uh, in recent years at least, we've been working with about 17 uh, counties in the state, the health departments within 17 counties. Um, with Zika virus, that number dramatically increased. This is, we saw the same sort of thing happen with West Nile. And so this past year, we had 74 local partners in 64 counties. Um, we got a, a close to a half a million mosquitoes uh, last year. Uh, and you can kind of see the volume of mosquitoes by week uh, that came into the lab. You know, at, at, the, at the peak, we were close to 40,000. And so we need help getting those mosquitoes processed so that we can get the results turned around to you guys very quickly on the testing and, and identifications. And once those mosquitoes are identified, uh, all of the Culex then are pooled into samples of up to 50. Um, and then those samples are sent to the lab for testing. So here what you see is the number of samples that uh, were collected each week and then tested. So at the peak, um, the lab was uh, handling 1,000 uh, plus samples uh, a week. And then uh, at the bottom of, this, of these bars, you can kind of see what the, what the proportion of each, um, each, the red proportion of each bar represents the number of samples that were positive for West Nile virus. So you can kind of see that that activity started pretty early, but it, was, it stayed very low and then sort of peaked around week 32 which is a normal, what I would call a normal West Nile virus year, not a particularly bad one, but we're, we know we're gonna have cases, but we're not gonna have a huge outbreak. What, we're, what we would be concerned about is if we saw that peak happen much earlier, or if it was much higher. <clears throat> Our surveillance also has detected these invasive species in Ohio, um, and I've already talked about Aedes albopictus and Aedes aegypti, but another invasive species that we have in Ohio that also came in, uh, probably through tire trades, um, is Aedes japonicus. And this is a mosquito that has become probably the second most common one that we collect in our traps in Ohio. Um, and it hasn't been directly implicated in disease transmission, but it is known from lab studies to be a capable vector of several diseases, including West Nile virus and lacrosse. So it's a mosquito that we sort of keep an eye on. Remember I told you that at any point, a new disease, you might have a new vector that hasn't been implicated before it becoming an important vector in the future, so worth keeping an eye on. So 
So back to monitoring the disease, uh, uh, West Nile virus in Ohio. Um, you can see here uh, uh, our, what we call minimum infection rate monitoring. And this is what we do week in and week out with our collections. And this is sort of a rough and dirt. You can do this at the local level as well, based on your mosquitoes that you collect. I do it based on the statewide collection, and that's what I send out to, um, to our local partners and local health departments, just to kind of share with everyone what we're seeing, what we're seeing in terms of virus activity. So you can see here, looking at uh, these three years worth of curves, um, you can see the 2016 curve here in red, uh, this is a typical year for West Nile virus. We saw a very similar situation in 2015. Um, that The activity was a little bit higher and we also had a larger number of cases. Now this graph is a little bit old. I think we had ended up the year with 17 or 18 cases of, of West Nile virus. But in 2012, that was our last outbreak year. Uh, we had 121 cases. And what you can see here is we were monitoring the infection rates. The infection rates are they, they're higher earlier and they go very, very high. And so we knew that year pretty early on it was going to be a bad year. We just didn't know how bad it would be. So looking at that 2012 um, outbreak, um, here you can see the uh, infection rate curve in mosquitoes that we were monitoring um, essentially in real time with about a week lag. Um, and then you can see the cases that were reported that same year, the human cases. And the important takeaway from this slide is that the surveillance for mosquitoes, the testing that we were doing, gave us a couple of weeks uh, heads up that we were heading into potentially bad outbreak conditions. And so public health alerts were going out uh, before we even started seeing human cases. Um, and then it ended up being a pretty bad year after all. So this sort of shows you the value of doing that surveillance. One thing I haven't mentioned is that our program has, um, you know, we are sustained by uh, a combination of federal and state funds, and those funds fluctuate, and I would say they fluctuate wildly. Um, and in 2013, they vanished altogether. So our program essentially went away. And at that point, we were relying on just a handful of local partners who were still doing uh, mosquito surveillance um, to give us any idea of what was going on uh, in the state. And I know some of you here uh, today are, were among those that we were relying on uh, to give us information. Uh, some local health departments were doing their own testing. I'm assuming that that probably took a little bit longer than normal uh, because you were using either private vendors or going out of state or you had to buy pack, uh, the, the kits. Um, but during that time, we weren't getting uh, uh, infection rate information. We were just getting trap count information. And it made me think, you know, what is the value of trap counts in determining or predicting um, virus versus knowing what the infection rates are and monitoring that throughout the season. Because you know the old school way of, of dealing with vector borne diseases was you based, it, based your control on trap count. And I'm not saying you shouldn't, you should uh, base your control on trap count if you don't have any other information. But we, I wanted to look to see what the correlation was. And so this is just sort of a very rough and dirty um, quasi-scientific uh, 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 approach here to just looking at the association between uh, outbreak, uh, number of human cases, and the trap counts versus the infection rates. And so what I did was we looked at a couple of health departments that have very consistent surveillance effort each year, um, because it varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction, we couldn't use everyone, but we, we picked a few that had very consistent effort each year. And we looked at those and we looked at the trap counts each year and sort of put that, we, we uh, superimposed that trap count line over the human case line. And you can see here that there's not a very good correlation uh, between the trap counts in a particular year uh, and the number of cases. And in fact, we had years where the trap counts were super high and we didn't have many cases at all. And you know, in particular, you can see that in 2008, we had very high trap counts. We had a lot of rain, a lot of mosquitoes produced, but it wasn't a bad West Nile virus year uh, by comparison. 
And then in 2012, when we had our big outbreak, the trap counts dropped. So if you're just going by trap counts, it's not, it's not as predictive to what kind of year you're going to have for West Nile virus. On the other hand, if you're monitoring mosquito infection rates, you can see that B correlation is a little bit higher. And so it is more predictive. We know that when the infection rates are high, that the risk to humans is higher, and we're going to have more cases. So that's the value of testing uh, for West Nile virus. So the third activity that I want to talk about is uh, sharing data. Um, you know, we process the information, and we develop these infection rates, and we, and we try to get this information out as frequently as possible. I know in the past I promised to do it every week or every other week, and then you've watched me break my promises every year. But I do try to get it as, as frequently as possible out to you. So this year we're only going to promise that we'll get out information as, as quickly as possible, as frequently as possible. Um, the information that we provide, uh, we provide information, uh, we provide an update on all arboviral activity, uh, arboviral diseases, uh, to all of our local health departments statewide and local partners. And this is an update that, that covers human, act, uh, human cases as well as veterinary cases and mosquito activity. It's sort of a, just a, a broad overview that we provide. But in addition to that, we try to um, uh, pretty frequently get information, uh, uh, our mosquito identification information back out to our partners directly. So that's a separate email that comes to our partners only. Uh, we just, I don't think that everybody else wants to know this stuff, but I know that our partners do. They want to know what species we've been seeing and, and uh, you know, what the test results, the specific test results were. So in this email we provide to our partners, we also attach uh, this, the spreadsheet, the database, the updated database, so you can go into that and get, the, and get your, tease out your specific information. In addition to that, we upload all of our data to uh, ArboNet, which is a CDC database that collects information on arboviral diseases. And then that information is then fed into uh, the USGS's disease maps website. And you can Google disease maps, and it's usually the top choice. Uh, but you go into disease maps and you can get these interactive maps where you can, uh, you can click, I think even down to the county level and get information on the number of cases. You can look at all the different arboviral diseases you can also look at different hosts, so you can get mosquito data, you can get um, veterinary data. Uh, if for people who are doing avian surveillance, you can get that data, and then human case uh, information. One caveat to this is that there's a lag, so it tends to be a couple weeks behind, um, but overall it's good information. Okay, so, um, with that, I am done. Are there any questions for me? Yes, sir. Is it possible to uh, modify the mosquitoes so that they're not carrying the diseases and transporting modifying them? Disease, modifying mosquitoes so that they're not carrying diseases? I've heard of modifying mosquitoes to control their numbers. Um, uh, and I would imagine that it is also possible to make a factory. But I would tell you that any modification of mosquitoes is also generally met with a lot of opposition because people don't like nature being messed with. Were you going to say something? You're just agreeing, yes. Because we did see that in, uh, in the Florida Keys. Um, they, there is a, there's a gene, uh, the Aedes aegypti, that can be inserted into Aedes aegypti that the males will pass on to the females when they mate with them, and it passes to the offspring, and then the offspring do not survive to adulthood. It's basically a lethal gene to the next generation. And it has been used in other areas of the, I think down in South and Central America, isn't that right, Brian? Yeah, it was a company out of uh, England that, uh, that started that, that GMO mosquito, and it was used a little bit in the Keys, and, but more so in the Caribbean with some limited success, yes. But initially, when they, when they first posed doing this in the Florida Keys, it was met with a lot of opposition yes. and protests. They did not want any kind of GMO thing happening uh, down there. Of course, their tune completely changed when they had that screw worm that was attacking the key deer, and they saw how devastating that was. 
and they talked about bringing in sterile males. I don't think there was any opposition to that because people's pets were being affected and, and the cute little deer were, they had these horrible wounds caused by the, by the maggots. So people were like, yeah, get rid of it. We don't care what you do. So, yes, sir. I had a question in relation to Zika. Um, there seems to be a big reaction in setting the traps and other things to try to find out what could this. But I also noticed in your charts that malaria is pretty well established as far as the travel. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I know anopheles is much more common at least in Summit County. And I'm just wondering why there's not been the same kind of reaction to malaria. And it seems to me the anopheles would be, we, we would be more ready to call it that. <coughs> Yeah, well, I, I can tell you that some of that is political. Um, our response, I, I mean, my concern has been the same for chicken. I, I was just as concerned about chikungunya, and I'm also concerned about malaria. But what we know is that uh, with, with malaria, um, we've had a few outbreaks over the years, uh, local transmission in the U.S. It tends to be pretty narrowly focused, and, not, uh, and it doesn't tend to be sustained very much. And I think this is because, um, you know, just normal infrastructure, screens and, and air conditioning, things like that, um, would would not, would not work against uh, malaria becoming established. And so when we've seen local outbreaks, it's usually, I mean, I, I can remember one involving a homeless population in Florida, and then I know that it, it's sometimes associated with camps. Um, but that doesn't mean that I wouldn't be concerned about local transmission of malaria. And I can tell you that when we have uh, when we have malaria cases reported to us that uh, where there's no travel history, it causes a great deal of excitement, um, both at the local level and in our, because we don't, you know, we used to have malaria in Ohio, but we don't anymore. And so, um, with all of those that I'm aware of so far, when they've been after they've been investigated, it's been determined that it was actually Babesia that these people had, which. Under, if you're looking at a slide of a blood smear, Babesia and malaria look the same, so to an untrained eye, uh, because they're both very closely related parasites. But you know, Babesia is transmitted by a tick, which is also a problem in Ohio. I don't know if I answered your question. I think I'm just commiserating with you about it. <laughs> I think people will focus on the microcephaly part of it. And, uh, oh, definitely, definitely. With Zika, it, it's, it's very much the concern about microcephaly and the uh, it's, it can be very devastating um, uh, to the unborn children. And I think that's where the, the big concern is with this one. Which is why the focus uh, on Zika more so than other uh, diseases that could potentially be transmitted in Ohio. And yes, of course, uh, Zika, um, we know once the virus hit Brazil, we found out that it causes microcephaly, which of course is devastating and a huge concern. But the other things that we found out about this virus is that there's, you know, there was so much that we didn't know and it was breaking, it just continued to break the rules on mosquito-borne diseases. Uh, with, um, with this virus, unlike the other mosquito-borne diseases that we're aware of, um, we found that it can be transmitted sexually between people. Um, we found that the virus can survive in other tissues for extended periods of time. You know, with 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 all these viruses, you know, once you once you fight the virus off, once you get over the symptoms, um, the virus is, the virus leaves your system. Your immune system takes care of it, and then you're you're typically uh, immune to the to the virus uh, for a extended period of time, maybe for the rest of your life. With Zika, what we have discovered is that um, uh, while the viremia lasts. And, and you know, once your body fights off the virus, it, it, you know, it, it, you're, you're kind of immune to the virus. However, uh, the virus has been found to survive for an extended period of times, uh, well beyond what has ever been seen with other arboviruses in certain body tissues, for example, uh, in, the, uh, in the testes uh, of men and in the ovaries of women. It, it can survive for a long period of time, which is why the recommendations on uh, sexual transmission and uh, for people who have contracted um, uh, Zika, which is why those recommendations for abstaining or using protection for uh, for a length of time after that, that's why those are in place. But really, it's just that with Zika, we just keep getting these curveballs. Uh, because remember, 
uh, throughout the history of, of our knowledge of DECA, there were very few cases up until a certain point that we started seeing more cases in the Pacific. And then when it hit um, South America, uh, we had just this, this massive outbreak. Uh, and at that point, we didn't know about microcephaly. It wasn't until after the outbreak in South America. And, and when microcephaly was first discovered in these people, we weren't even sure that Zika was the cause. And if you remember from the news reports, they were looking at other potential causes like uh, pesticides. And, and so it took us a while to realize that microcephaly was an effect of Zika virus. And so it's for all of those reasons that Zika is an increased concern. You know, we have much more concern about this virus because it keeps throwing these curveballs at us. It does not play by any of the rules uh, that other